If you would, as you're being seated, take your Bible and go with me to James chapter 2. We're going to pick up where we left off last week. Remember, we looked at the back half of James chapter 1 last week. James is the brother of Jesus. He's writing to mostly Jewish Christians who are scattered across Palestine that are sort of in dispersion. And he writes to, to tell them that he wants them to be whole Christians, to be perfect, complete, lacking in nothing. And remember last week we, we talked about the way that, that James reminds believers that if we've truly believed the gospel, that the gospel will have certain effects in our life, that it'll work its way out. If the Holy Spirit's doing a work in us, that he'll do a work out of us. And this is maybe possibly one of the earliest books written in the New Testament, yet it's a book about how the gospel changes our life, changes the way that we live. At the end of chapter 1, we, we looked at the way that, that James talks about the way the Bible transforms us. And one of the things that James says the, the Bible does to us is that it causes us to care for the vulnerable. Remember he said that, that the pure and undefiled religion is to visit the widow and the orphan in their affliction. And so he picks up that theme again here in chapter 2 as he brings in the idea of partiality. And what James does here in James chapter 2, really beginning in verse 1 down through verse 13, is to, to show us that partiality has no place in the life of the church, that we ought not to show favoritism. So that's what James writes, James chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. James says, My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. James tells us that you cannot hold tight to Jesus and hold tight to partiality, that you will have to let go of one. Almost 15 years ago now, I was in the Dominican Republic with a group of college students. We were uh, working with a church there, working in, with some evangelism uh, projects and doing some things in their city. And I remember one day we were driving through the city, and as we, we passed a bunch of construction sites, one of the college students asked one of our guides, who, who was from the church that we were working with, he said, I noticed as we drive past these construction sites that, that all the folks working, all the folks doing the labor don't look Dominican. So who, who are they? Are they from the DR? And, and uh, our guide said, no, they're, they're not. They're, most of them are Haitian. And he began to explain to us that the relationship between the Dominicans and the Haitians was a really tense one, that largely the Dominicans did not like the Haitians. They looked down upon them because of their poverty, and when they could, they would oppress them. They would take advantage of them. And so he said, what happens is that, that uh, when somebody has a construction project, they'll bring in Haitians, they'll bring them illegally over the border and bring them into the DR, and they'll, they'll ask them to come work a job, and rather than paying them day by day or week by week or even month by month, They'll promise them that they'll get their wages when the job is done. And because these people are desperate, they'll come. Uh, and what happens is at the end of the project, rather than paying their workers, they'll call the authorities and have the Haitians ship back to Haiti with no money. And he said, one of the hardest things that we deal with as we share the gospel and as we seek to build the church here in the DR is convincing new believers, people who have put their faith and trust in Jesus, that you cannot hold fast to faith in Christ and hold on to your hate, your hate for the Haitians. You cannot hold fast to Jesus and hold fast 
to partiality, you're going to have to let one of the two go. Partiality is, in many ways, a unique sin. I, I can think of few sins that cause such a visceral reaction in us when we see it in other people. And yet, at the same time, a sin that we are so easily ensnared by. We so easily fall into partiality. When we see it in somebody else, our conscience flares up, right? We say, well, that's not fair. That's not right. But when we show partiality or when it operates in our favor, we are seemingly blind to it. James writes to remind his his believers, these, these folks who claim to be in Christ, that if they are to be whole Christians, mature Christians, that they should have no part of partiality. He, he tells them that whole Christians hold the faith with no partiality. You notice what he says there in, in verse 1. The way that he says it is interesting. He says, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. The, the ESV is right, to, to I think, to translate uh, the show no partiality as an imperative, but really the only imperative in the verb, or in the verse there, is the hold the faith. So what, what James literally says is, as you hold on to the faith, do so with no partiality. You can't hold on to faith in Jesus and show partiality. So what does he mean by partiality? Well, he gives us an example in verses 2 and 3. That at the beginning, seem hypothetical. It seems as if James is concocting a hypothetical situation. But the longer we read in the passage, we realize this isn't hypothetical at all. It's the very thing that's happening as these believers gather for their services. He says that, that, that partiality is, that the word there is to literally, to receive by the face. That partiality is to make judgments, to make distinctions of men based on outward things. Things like money and social status and skin color and education level, right? that, that we judge people out based on the outward things, receiving by the face. And James says, you're doing this when you gather for worship. You see the rich man come in. You know he's rich because of his clothes. You see his, his fine clothes. You see his ring. And, and you say to him, here, have the seat of honor. You give him the place of most honor, of most comfort, of most access. And he says, at the same time, you see the poor man come in. You, you pay attention to the rich man, but you, you don't say much to the poor man. You say to him, you can stand in the back, or you can sit here at my feet. Now, if you came in today and I said you could sit here at my feet, that would be offensive to you. It is a thousand times more offensive in the first century in a, a largely Jewish honor culture to say you can sit here at my feet. And, and James says you have shown partiality, you have judged by the face, and honoring the rich and dishonoring the poor, and, and showing disrespect for the poor. We've all probably been in places where we've seen this even within the church. If you've been in church long, if you've been in different churches, you've probably been in a church at some point in your life, I know that I have, where the people who made the decisions in the church, the leaders in the church, were not necessarily always the most godly or the most mature or those that had shown themselves faithful. That sometimes in some churches, those that make the decisions and have the most influence are simply those who have the most money, those who give the most, or sometimes it's even just those who people assume give the most. I, I have a, a friend who pastors a church in the South who right now is having a problem with his church because he, he met a man in his neighborhood and shared the gospel with him, and, and this man trusted Christ. And when he came to, to baptize that man in his church, his deacon says, no, we're not baptizing him here. And do you know why they say they're not baptizing him? It's because of the color of his skin. And he said, well, we don't do that in this church. There's another church down the road he can go to and get baptized there. We know what partiality looks like. And what James says is that partiality does not fit the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. The two cannot go together. And so what James does is introduce this idea in verse 1 and then spend the rest of the chapter, the, the, rather the rest of this passage, explaining to us why the gospel and partiality do not go together. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to follow and trace out James' argument of why partiality is incompatible with the gospel. So this is what James says. The partiality is incompatible with the gospel for, number one, it relies on evil reasoning. And he gives the, this example of the way that they've shown partiality. And then if you look down at verse 4, he says, When you've done this, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Now, the, the word that he uses there for, for thoughts is, is not just simply thoughts that you might have in your head. That it, it is more thought processes. That the, the word judge is crino, and the word thoughts there is diacrino. It's the way that you judge. 
So he says, you've become judges with evil judgments, evil reasoning, evil thought process, that you think through this wrong. You have judged people wrongly. And so the spirit of partiality relies on evil thoughts. I find it interesting that he doesn't say that you've become judges with faulty reasoning or with less than ideal thoughts. He says that that partiality produces in us wicked thoughts, that it relies on lies about the gospel and lies about who people are. So what are some of those lies? What what are those evil thoughts, the evil reasoning? Well, James gives us, I think, in the context, really three. So that, that partiality is incompatible with the gospel because it relies on evil reasoning. First, it teaches us to believe that I am the judge. He says, have you not, when you show partiality, have you not become judges? Have you not, when you judge another person, have you not set yourself up as the judge to make a distinction, to make a judgment about other people? This is what partiality does. It it convinces us that we are in a spot to judge. It, It teaches us to assume that we have two things, that we have both the authority and the ability to judge other people. How many times in your life have you made a judgment about somebody? By the way they look, or the car they drive, or or even just in your first five minutes with them, you've made a judgment about somebody, and yet that judgment proved to be wrong. And yet, it doesn't seem to matter how often we're wrong, we still seem always to believe that we have both the ability and the authority to judge other people. James says, you've set yourself up as judges. Have you not then become judges with evil thoughts? That Who is the judge of the Bible? Who is the judge of men? It's not me. It is God. God alone has the authority. God alone has the ability to judge men. It is not my place to judge men. It's a, it's a relief that I'm not the judge, that we can trust that God is the judge. But the spirit of partiality teaches me I'm the judge. It's evil reasoning. It's evil thoughts. Second, the spirit of partiality relies on evil thoughts and that it, it teaches us that Jesus is not glorious. You notice what he says there in verse 1. It may not seem strange to us that he uses the name of Jesus. He says, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. But the fact that James uses the name of Jesus and calls him the Lord of glory is important for us, for it is only the second time in the book that James uses the name of Jesus. The only other time in the book is way back at the beginning of the book in verse 1, where James calls himself a servant of God and of Jesus Christ. And the name of Jesus shows up nowhere else in the book except for chapter 2, verse 1, when he says, Show no partialities, you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus. And what does he call Jesus? The Lord of glory. That James reminds these believers who are tempted to be impressed by men that it is Jesus who is the Lord of glory. It is Jesus that is glorious. The spirit of partiality is easily impressed with the things of the world with money and with wealth and influence and power and skin color, all the ways in which the world is impressed. And and James says, Jesus is the Lord of glory. That you cannot be simultaneously in all of the glory of Christ and supremely impressed by men. He says, as you hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, show no partiality. What is beautiful to you? What matters to you? What is valuable to you? Is it money and power and influence? If so, you will show partiality. But as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, as members of his body, we are those that say, no, we are not impressed by men. We're not impressed by their jobs or their cars or their money or their influence or their power. We are supremely enraptured by the Lord of glory. We are not impressed by what impresses the world. We are impressed by the son of a carpenter who was crucified, dead, and buried, and raised for our sake, who now with nail-scarred hands sits at the right hand of God the Father. That's who we're impressed by. That's who we're enraptured by. Jesus, the Lord of glory. Partiality says Jesus is not glorious. So we ought to be impressed by men and show partiality. You see the evil reasoning, the, the evil thoughts that partiality relies on. It's not just Not just that it says wrong things about who Jesus is or even says wrong things about who we are as a judge, but partiality teaches us to believe wrong things about other people. It's incompatible with the gospel because it relies on evil thoughts, evil reasoning. And the third that James lays out here is, is that partiality teaches us to believe that some men are not worthy of dignity. He says the rich have come in and you've paid attention to them. You've given them the seat of honor. 
You've said, come sit here, have this place of honor and access and comfort. But when the poor man came in, it's not just that you, you weren't nice to him. He says that you have dishonored him. You have disrespected this man. And what partiality does in us is that it causes us to demean other human beings and to treat them as less than human. I, I remember uh, it was a few years ago now I was having a conversation with one of the men who works at the men's shelter here in Frankfurt. We were there for a serve Frankfurt day, and I remember asking him, what are other things throughout the year, other ways that we could serve you guys? What are, what are things that you need? Uh, could we come clean? Can we, do, do you need more clothes? Do you need food? What, what are things that we could do for you? And he said, honestly, all those things are great. They're good, but, but what we really need is just some guys to come down here and eat dinner. If you could just get some guys to come down here and and watch a ball game with these guys. He said, they, because of their life situation, because of where they are, they feel worthless. They feel stripped of their dignity. They see how people look at them when they're on the street. They know that if they go outside and they walk down the street and a family is approaching them, they know what's going to happen. But that family's going to avert their eyes and they're going to cross over to the other side of the road. They have lost all dignity, and they, they feel sometimes less than human. If you could just get somebody down here just to be with them. The spirit of partiality demeans other human beings made in the image of God and treats them as if they are less than human. Can't forget, this happened here, in this body. 200 years ago, four miles that way, when you came into a service at Buck Run, you were literally sorted by the, your skin color. You were literally received by the face. That white people sat in one section and slaves sat in another. John Taylor, the Baptist pioneer who was not the first pastor of Buck Run, but was their first preacher who preached for them for the first several years, uh, after, a few years after Buck Run had been founded, wrote of Buck Run. Buck Run has, a, has at least two things going for it. They have very few black folk. And they have very few rich folk. One is above the gospel, and one is below it. That slaves were allowed to be members, but they were not allowed to vote in business meetings. Do you know why? Because the assumption is that slaves would not vote freely, but they would vote according to however their master wanted them to vote. And so slaves could be members, but they could not vote in business meetings because the church deemed it to be unfair. Partiality takes people made in the image of God. And treats them as if they are not human. Now praise God that Buckron is now not like she was, at least in that way, 200 years ago. Right? We praise God that the gospel has won in that respect here at Buckron. That you get seated now based on what time you get here. Right? The, the, if you get here early, you get up front. The, the, the gospel has won in that sense. But we must be careful to not simply just look back and to say, well, how did they do that? How did people act that way? And forget that the sin of partiality has a, a really easy way of finding its way into our heart even here and now. So do you show partiality? When you come to a service, as you park your car, if you see a really nice car pulled into the visitor parking spot, and you see a family get out, and they're well-dressed, and they're put together, is there a part of you that thinks, well, I hope they end up here. They'd be really good for us. Or if a car pulls into the visitor parking spot and it's duct taped and it's mismatched paint and the people get out and their clothes are dirty and, and ratty and they look disheveled, is there a part of you that thinks, I wonder what they want? I wonder if they're going to ask for something from us. When you walk downtown, when you go get your hoggies and you're walking down the street, and you see somebody coming towards you, and he's got dirty jeans, and his shoes are tattered, and he's got a coat that's three sizes too big, do you look down and cross to the other side of the road? When your, your kid says, I, I want a play date with somebody in my class, do you spend a little bit more time in the car line that week trying to get a glimpse of that family? What car do they drive? What do the parents look like? What sort of clothes do they wear? Are they, are they like me? What, what sort of people are we inviting into our life? That we are tempted in a million different ways to show partiality, to say to those that we favor, come, have the seat of honor. And to say to those who we don't like, you can sit over there. 
Come, you who voted like me, have the seat of honor. If you voted for the other guy, you can sit over there. Come, you who have the same amount of money as I do, have the seat of honor. Everybody else can sit over there. Come, you who share my same social status or educational achievements or or professional achievements, have the seat of honor. Everybody else can sit over there. The dangerous thing about partiality is that when we show partiality, it doesn't always show. That sometimes the seat of honor is not a physical seat in a sanctuary. Sometimes the seat of honor is merely a place of respect and affection in our mind and in our heart. And this ought not be so in the church. That we ought to, in this body, we ought to be the ones that again and again and again are saying that every man and woman is worthy of dignity and respect before it because they are made in the image of God. Regardless of their social status, regardless of their bank account, regardless of their educational achievements, regardless of their immigration status, regardless of anything that they've accomplished in their life, every single man and woman on the planet is worthy of dignity and respect because they are made in the image of God. But the spirit of partiality would have me believe otherwise. So therefore, I need the mind of Christ. I need to begin to see people, not in their relation to me, but I need to begin to see people in relation to Jesus. That out there, throughout the six days of the week, we are divided and distinctions are made and we are judged among a thousand different lines. Out there in the world, the other six days of the week, we are divided according to what we make and what our skin color looks like and who we voted for and what job we do, what neighborhood we live in. We are divided in a thousand different ways. And James says, not in here. In here, in the body of Jesus, we have two categories. Those who are in Christ... And those who are out of Christ, those who have received mercy, and those who are in need of mercy, those who are a part of the family of God, and thus are my brothers and sisters, and those who are outside of Christ, and that I long to be brought into the family of God, those who have received mercy and forgiveness and grace from the Lord Jesus, and those who need rescue from the coming judgment. I began to see people not in how they are like me or uh, different than me, I begin to see people and how they are related to Christ. We must, in that sense, have the mind of Christ. Then partiality is incompatible with the gospel because it relies on evil reasoning, evil thought processes. And not just that, but partiality is incompatible with the gospel because of what it says about the gospel itself. Partiality is incompatible with the gospel because it cheapens the riches of the gospel. Notice what James says. He, he says that our accounting method is all off. That when we show partiality, we show that the way that we judge rich and poor is off base, that it's out of whack. How does partiality cheapen the, the riches of the gospel? It does it first by ignoring the inheritance of the kingdom. The the believers that James writes to, they're honoring the rich and they're dishonoring the poor. They're having the poor sit in the back. And James says, you've misjudged who's really rich and who's really poor. You're judging who's rich and who's poor based on the clothes that they wear. And and James says, haven't you forgotten that the ones who are rich are those who, who do what? who love the Lord Jesus and are rich in faith and are heirs according to the kingdom. You you can just imagine these believers saying to James, yeah, but James, these people are poor. And what James says is, no, they're not. Not if they're in Christ. If they're in Christ, they are rich in faith. We're reminded of what Paul said. He says, not many of you were noble. Not many of you were wise. Not many of you were powerful or influential. And he says, and yet God chose you to bring to the gospel to the world. He reminds us that if we are in Christ, if we have repented of our sins and put our faith in the Lord Jesus, regardless of your social status or economic status in the world, you are rich. What do we have as our inheritance? We are heirs of the kingdom. In Christ, what will we get? We will get it all. James says you have judged based on economic advantage. Not on what the gospel says. You have cheapened the riches of the gospel and assumed that the poor are poor. But if they are in Christ, James says, they are rich. It is a good reminder for us this year. A lot of you have lost jobs, been furloughed, or had financial difficulty this year. It is important for you to remember 
that no matter what sort of economic disadvantage you might be at, that if you are in Christ, you are rich. And you always will be. And the inverse is also true. If you are relying on the comfort and the ease and the protection that your bank account and your large retirement account provides you, you need to be reminded that if you are not in Christ, the Bible says, regardless of your, um, the money in your bank account, that you are not rich, but you are poor. So James says riches and poverty are not based on what sort of money you have. but The riches and poverty are based on whether or not you're in Christ. Whether or not you're rich in faith, you are an heir to the kingdom because you love the Lord. That partiality cheapens the riches of the gospel by ignoring the inheritance of the kingdom, ignoring what we have in Jesus. And and when our value system is off, when our our accounting is so out of whack like this, it it leads us not just to ignoring the, the inheritance of the kingdom, but it leads us to dishonoring the poor. He says, you've honored the rich, but you have You have dishonored, have you not? You have dishonored the poor man. That You have treated him as if he is not worthy of honor. The partiality leads us to care more about riches, earthly riches, than riches in faith. And when we do this, we we miss what the Bible says about God's heart for the poor. Again and again and again, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, we we hear about God's heart for the poor. That In Proverbs, we we read that whoever oppresses the poor is an insult to his maker, but he who gives generously to the needy honors him. The Bible tells us that God cares about the poor. Now, we have to be clear here that what we mean by that, what the Bible means by that, is not what what liberation theology would say, is that, that, that some people are saved only because they're poor, that it's their poverty that saves them. That's not what the Bible says. That The Bible does say things about sloth and about unwillingness to work. It calls both of those things sin. That, that Timothy says that if a man is unwilling to work to provide for his family, he's worse than an unbeliever. The Bible speaks to those things. But we have to be honest that in the history of mankind, most people in abject poverty are not there because of sloth and unwillingness to work. The Bible tells us that God has a heart for the poor, that he cares for the poor. It's the very reason that James, remember last week in chapter 1, tells us that we ought to care for widows and orphans. Why do widows and orphans need our care? Because they're poor. They have no social safety net to take care of them. They need help. And so he says, visit them in their affliction that you might care for them. God cares for the poor. When we dishonor the poor, we insult God and we miss his heart for the poor. That often, often what God does is the suffering and the pain that comes with poverty is the very thing that God uses to show people their need of a Savior. There's a reason Jesus says it's difficult for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. That riches often bring with it comfort and safety and security that numb us to our need of Christ. And yet poverty often is the thing that strips away all, all those empty desires that allow us to, to know we, our need of a Savior. God has a heart for the poor That if we cheapen the riches of the gospel, we'll ignore the inheritance of the kingdom. We'll dishonor the poor. And it leads us then to fawning over the rich. Not only will we look down on the poor, but we'll unnecessarily fawn over the rich. Notice the the irony here that James points out. You're dishonoring the poor. And the rich are in with their nice clothes and their rings. And you're giving them the seat of honor. and, And James says, don't you see how foolish that is? These rich that you're fawning over. Aren't they the ones that oppress you and drag you into court? Aren't they the ones that are blaspheming the name of the Savior by which you have been called? Now, uh, James gives some idea for us of what he means by dragging them into court later in the book. when he, he talks about the way that the rich are defrauding their workers. They're not paying them the wages that are owed them. But we know, especially even in this time, that, that often those who had financial ability, those who had financial advantage, would use their financial advantage to take advantage of other people. So if you have a bad year of your crop, you go to a rich man, and you ask for a loan, often what would happen is he would give you a loan at, a, at exorbitant interest, and then the next year when you had another bad crop, rather than showing grace and mercy and working with you, he would then drag you into court and use the court system to take everything that you had, often not even paying you the very thing that you were owed. He says, you're showing preference to the rich, and they're oppressing you. They're using you. They are blaspheming the name by which you have been called. That might mean literal, explicit blaspheming of Jesus, speaking ill of the gospel. But it might even be simply just refusing to trust Jesus, just refusing to come to faith in Christ. He says, you're you're fawning over the wrong people. They don't love the Lord. They're blaspheming the Lord. They're oppressing you. And, 
And yet, if we're honest, can't we see how these believers did it? So we do it. Throughout the history of the church, not even just the last hundred years, we could say the last 2,000 years, that we have fallen into this again and again and again. This is the celebrity culture that we are enamored by. That whenever somebody rich or powerful or influential, right, an athlete, a musician, a movie star, a politician, whoever it might be, whenever somebody like that even hints that they might be a Christian, we get super excited. Right, that we, we lower the bar for the rich, the powerful, the influential, and we raise the bar for the people we don't like. So, movie star X has a Bible verse tattooed on his arm. He's basically a pastor. Right? We're so thankful for him. Right? He's definitely a believer. But yet, when you hear that the lady in your office who you don't like, somebody says, did you, did you hear that Janice is going to church? Yeah, did you hear that she's a believer? And you say, Janice? Man, no way. I'll believe it when I see it. We have lowered the bar for the powerful and influential. We have raised the bar for those we don't like. And what has happened to us, not just in the last 100 years, but the last 2,000 years, every time that we have been enamored with the rich and the powerful and influential, when they've even hinted that they might love Jesus, we do it because we hope that they might use their riches and power and influence on our behalf. And yet what happens to us nearly every single time? We get duped. We get used. We get manipulated. And James says to these believers, that's exactly what's happening to you. You're showing honor to people who don't love you, who don't like you, who oppress you, who don't care about the name of Jesus by which you have been called. They blaspheme that very name. Partiality leads us to cheapening the riches of the gospel, to not accounting the world the way that we ought. Therefore, I must cherish the right treasure. We must ask ourselves, do we really believe that Jesus is better? We say that, we sing that, but do we really believe that Jesus is better than anything this world has to offer? That I would rather have Jesus than all the riches, than all the power, than all the influence, than anything that the world has to offer? That do we really believe that we would rather have Jesus? If that's true, then I will not judge people based on what the world can give. But I will put my riches in Christ. My treasure will be in Christ. What does Jesus say about our treasure? Where your treasure is, what? There your heart will be also. If your treasure is in this world, it's in riches and power and influence and social status in the world, you will show partiality. But Jesus says our treasure is not here. Our treasure is in the gospel. Our treasure is in the inheritance that we have coming in the kingdom, that Jesus is better than all this world has to offer. And so we will show no partiality because we are not impressed by riches or poverty. We are impressed by Christ and our riches are in the gospel. That's how we judge riches and poverty is by riches in the gospel. So James says partiality is incompatible with the gospel because it relies on evil reasoning, because it, it cheapens the riches of the gospel, Right? So what it says about us, what it says about the, the gospel itself, and, and third, that partiality is incompatible with the gospel because it inverts the law of love. Listen to what James says. He, he quotes here from Leviticus 19. He says in verse 8, if you really fulfill the royal law, the, the kingdom ethic, the, what it means to be in the kingdom of Jesus, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing well. It's a quote from Le Leviticus 19. Some commentators think that as James, James writes his letter, that he has Leviticus 19 in his mind. That, that in Leviticus 19, we see many of the same themes that James uh, addresses in his letter. That it's in Leviticus 19 that God tells the people of Israel that they ought to leave the corners of their fields untouched as a way to care for the poor. It's where God tells them that they shouldn't slander one another. They, they shouldn't use the courts to oppress each other. They should be kind and, to the poor and generous to the needy. And, and it's in Leviticus 19 that he says you ought to love your neighbor as yourself. We see in Matthew 22, Jesus pick up this same theme when he's asked, what is the, the, the greatest commandment? What does Jesus say? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. And the second is like it. You love your neighbor as yourself. That to keep the royal law is to love God. And then out of that love of God, we love our neighbor as ourself. And what James says is that when we show partiality, not only have we broken that law and become transgressors, look at the way that partiality takes what we're called to and flips it on its head. 
that partiality leads me to, rather than loving my neighbor, partiality leads me to loving myself by using my neighbor. Who do we show partiality to? People who are like us or people who we believe could benefit us? So the spirit of partiality teaches me to view other people not as neighbors to be loved, but as pawns to be used. The lens by which I will see the world will be people's usefulness to me. If you're useful to me, I will show you partiality. If you're not, you can sit at my feet. It inverts the law of love. Rather than loving my neighbor as myself, I use my neighbor to love myself. And notice here, James is a genius. He's writing by the Holy Spirit. He's He's brilliant in what he does, that James knows the very way that these believers and us are going to try to wiggle out from underneath of this. Our temptation is going to say, okay, yes, James, you you have gotten us, we do do this, but it's just partiality, right? It's not like I murdered anybody. It's not like I've committed adultery. I've kept the really hard commandments, the the big ones. I've kept those, so so I show partiality here and there. He he gets our instinct to want to sort of wiggle out by saying that we've kept some of the laws. And this is the way that that partiality inverts the law of love. We love ourselves by using our neighbor, and we think that we're keeping the law by keeping a law. This is the sin calculus that we do. I remember... Uh, I had a, a friend in college who claimed to be a believer, has since walked away from the faith. He was, at the time, uh, living with and sleeping with his girlfriend. And I remember having a conversation with him once, and he said, Listen, I don't drink, I don't do drugs, I don't steal, I get good grades, I work hard at my job, and I do all those things so I can do this thing. Right? I keep the law here, they buy me some leeway over here. If we're honest... Don't we all have ways in which we think that obedience to the law in one area buys us some leeway to disobey the law in another area? We think that we can keep the law by keeping a law, by keeping a part of it. So so I don't show partiality. Maybe I show a little partiality, but at least I've not murdered. At least I've not shown adultery. And by the way, isn't it interesting that those are the two sins that James uses? You first read that and you think, boy, James, couldn't you think of you know, less brutal sins? Couldn't you put lust or jealousy or covetousness in there? You, you put murder and you put adultery. What does James say? We think we can keep the law, we can keep all of it by keeping part of it. And James says, you can keep all of it. And if you fail at one point, you're a what? You're a transgressor. If you fail at one point, James says, you're accountable for it all. The partiality teaches me to excuse my disobedience because I have obedience in other areas, that partial obedience is acceptable before the Lord. And James says, partiality is a sin, that it is serious, that it matters, and that it causes us to be accountable before the Lord. That this is why, why partiality is incompatible with the gospel, but it teaches me that my obedience does not matter. So therefore, I must love my neighbor as myself. Rather than using people to love myself, I must love my neighbor as myself. I need to love the Lord, my God, with all my heart, all my soul, all my mind, with all my strength. That out of that love of God, I might love other people selflessly. Not by how they might benefit me. Not by how how they, they might reciprocate my kindness. But only because they're people worthy of dignity and respect, made in the image of God, that I might love my neighbor as myself. That's what the gospel calls us to. So James says, Partiality is incompatible with the gospel because it relies on evil reasoning, because it cheapens the riches of the gospel, because it inverts the law of love, and then lastly, because it forgets the coming judgment. James, again and again in his epistle, points us to the end of all things. He keeps coming around to judgment. He he keeps pointing us to the end of all things. And so James says there at the end in, in verse 12, so speak and so act are those, as those who are to be judged according to or under the law of liberty. Then he reminds us of the coming judgment and he says to us, remember, your deeds and your words matter. What you say and what you do matter. But Paul dealt with a, a heresy that said, well, if when I sin, if God shows me grace, then the more I sin, the more grace God shows me, So therefore, shouldn't I keep sinning? Therefore, that the more I sin, that grace may abound all the more. What does Paul say to that? By no means. 
Paul says, yes, in Christ we have forgiveness and we find grace. But Paul says that the forgiveness and grace we have in Jesus is not license for us to sin. He says we should not let sin abound, that grace may abound all the more. We should strive for holiness. We should strive for obedience. That James reminds us that, yes, at the end of all things, on Judgment Day, I will find mercy and forgiveness and grace. But that does not mean that my words and deeds don't matter. Well, my words and deeds matter very much. Jesus says that on Judgment Day, I'm going to have to give an account for every careless word I've ever spoken. Paul says that we're going to have to stand before the judgment seat of God and receive what is due us for the deeds done in the body, whether good or evil. In 2 Corinthians 5, Paul uses the imagery of building on a foundation. He says our life is like building up on this foundation, and some build with hay and stubble and and wood, and some build with gold and silver, and then on Judgment Day, our, our works are going to be tested. They're going to be burned with fire, and some will burn off and be worthless, but, but some will remain and will receive rewards for them. That, that when we come before the Lord, that we, we want to offer to him a life of obedience, a life that Paul says is a living sacrifice. Our words and our deeds do matter. So James says... The way we treat people, what we say and what we do, we ought to act as those who know judgment day is coming. Partiality says what you say and what you do doesn't really matter. You're saved, you've got grace, live how you want in this life. Judgment day is irrelevant to you. And James reminds us, no, so speak and so act as those who know that you are going to be judged under the law of liberty, under the the word of the Lord. We believe that our words and our deeds matter. That on judgment day, I want to, by the help of the Holy Spirit, as best I can, I want to be Z.T. Lester. I, I want to present decades and decades and decades of faithful service to the Lord as best as I can. My words and my deeds matter. And yet, On Judgment Day, when I stand before the Lord, no matter how faithful I've been, everything I receive from God will all be of mercy. I find it interesting that nearly every time that James talks about judgment in his his epistle, it's like he can't talk about judgment without almost immediately bringing up mercy. That he reminds us that for judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy, that mercy triumphs over judgment, that mercy is my only hope. That when I stand before the judgment seat of God, I will stand, regardless of how faithful I've lived in this life, I will stand still in need of mercy. And I believe that when I'm before Jesus, the judgment seat of Christ, I believe that I will receive mercy. Now, how is that possible? How is it that I will receive mercy? How do I know? Why why would I not be a crazy person for believing that I will receive mercy? Me. There are millions of people who have lived lives more faithful to me, have done more for the Lord, who have have seen more people come to faith, have preached better sermons, have done uh, so many great things besides me. Why would I, of all people, why would I receive mercy? Because God is not a God of partiality. He's not a God who shows favoritism. Old King James says he is no respecter of persons. We ought to praise God that he is not a God of partiality. He was not a God of partiality when he called an old man and his barren wife out of Ur of Chaldea and said, I'm going to make a nation out of you. That he was not a God of partiality when he, he told Jacob, the liar and the trickster, I'm going to make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and all the families of the earth will be blessed through you. But he was not a God of partiality when he took David, the ruddy runt of the litter, and he made him the greatest king that Israel had ever known. He was not a God of partiality when, when he brought the light of the world into our lives by an unwed teenage mother and her poor carpenter fiancé. He was not a God of partiality when he called 12 uneducated fishermen and tax collectors and zealots and turned the world upside down with them and built his church. He was not a God of partiality when he ransomed his people, not with money and not with might, but with the broken blood and the shed blood, the broken body and shed blood of his own son. And he was not a God of partiality when he found me 25 years ago at Central Baptist Church, Marion County, Kentucky. A seven-year-old boy in a broken family with nothing to offer the Lord. And yet he found me and he gave me mercy and grace and forgiveness and he brought me into his family. And if you're here and you're in Christ, you're in Christ because God is not a God of partiality. 
because he has shown you mercy. Maybe you're here and you're not in Christ and you've not come to Christ because you feel that maybe God doesn't want you. With all you've done, with all you have and all you don't have, that, that God doesn't want your kind, you need to be reminded of what the Bible says, that God is not a God of partiality. He is not impressed by your money. He, he is not overcome by your poverty. He doesn't care what you've done or where you live or what you do. That God says that all those who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Because he is not a God of partiality. He is a God of mercy and kindness. So won't you come to Christ today? That all those in Christ, we have mercy waiting on us. As we think about the coming judgment, what do we have at the coming judgment? We have mercy waiting for us there. So therefore, I must live in light of eternity. I have experienced mercy in the here and now, and I have mercy waiting for me at the judgment day. And what does James say? How, does that, how should that change the way that I live? He says, for judgment is without mercy... To the one who has shown no mercy. It's the same thing that Jesus says. Pastor Scott read it for us today in the Beatitudes. That that the merciful will receive mercy. It's the the parable of the unforgiving servant that Jesus teaches. That the idea here is not that by showing mercy we earn mercy. But the idea here is that, that if we show mercy. That is evidence that we have received mercy. That if I show no mercy. Jesus and Paul and James seem to say. That I have not actually received mercy. That if I have mercy waiting for me at the end of all times, if I have mercy both now and in the age to come, then my life should be characterized by mercy for other people. For if I am in Christ, I am one for whom mercy has triumphed over judgment. Here and now, for however many years the Lord allows me to live on this earth, when I see the Lord, I have mercy waiting on me. And so James says, if you've received mercy, you ought to show mercy. Live in light of the coming judgment and be merciful people, not those who show partiality. Mercy has triumphed over judgment. You cannot hold fast to Jesus and hold fast to partiality. You will have to let one go. If you are in Christ, mercy has triumphed over judgment. Hold fast to the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, and show no partiality.